tables and kitchen tables. Um, it's very exciting uh, to have you all here. We have a big group. Um, and I just want to thank Bill Rins for being our tech guy, for making it all possible, for keeping us on agenda and going straight. He works um, directly for Rotary International for the Rotary Peace Fellow Alumni Association. Um, and also to thank all the facilitators. We have a group of, I think, 10 facilitators who are volunteering for the breakout groups later that are part of this webinar. Um, and really grateful to all of them for their time on this, um, as well as to all the Rotary Peace Fellow community and the Rotarians who support us. Um, this has really gotten off with a, a lot of energy. Um, this is part, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that we're doing. This is the second one. And I'm excited to say that next week there will, uh, on Thursday, there will be one on food security and peace under COVID. So please keep an eye out uh, for our Thursday series. Today, um, we are starting, uh, today our focus is on climate change, environment and peace under COVID-19. We have three incredible speakers to get us thinking and brainstorming. Um, about that, and I'd like to go um, straight into them. Um, let me just say that our speakers are, let me see if I can get here. Um, you are seeing my screen, and so now I have to move it. How do I do that? Get out of there. So our speakers are Daniel Cooney, who will speak first. He's the actor and director of the Communications Division of the United Nations Environment Program. He'll be followed by uh, Chiara Liguri. Did I do that right, Chiara? Um, she's the policy advisor on environment and human rights at Amnesty International. And then Elisa Hernandez de Pablo, who's head of environment at La Casa Incendida, Fundación Montre Madrid. They are all basically on European time, so grateful to all three of them for uh, joining us on um, in a different time zone, a little bit later for them. And we're going to get started um, right away. Uh, the questions that were posed to the panelists are these three. What are the connections between the environment, climate change, and peace that move us forward to our goal of positive peace? What kind of constructive disruptions might come our way and how might we meet them during the COVID-19 pandemic? And what are the intended and unintended benefits and opportunities of the pandemic? What existing or new tools will we need to meet them? And I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Daniel, you can take it away. Thank you, Anna. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. All right. So, hi, everybody. My name is Daniel Cooney. I'm the Acting Director of Communication at the UN Environment Program. Um, we're, I'm based at our global headquarters, which is in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so, um, oh, I should also say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Peace Fellow, um, and I had the, the real honor and privilege of doing a Master's of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, with the support of, of, of the Peace, Peace Fellowship Program, um, for which I'm eternally grateful. So let me sort of start my talk just by, by saying I'm sure most people here have, have seen the stories that, you know, greenhouse gases are down, air quality is up. We've seen wild animals on the streets of our cities, or at least stories of them. You know, waterways in cities like Venice look cleaner. Um, the... COVID lockdown is giving people a taste of what life could be like with a, a cleaner environment. Um, but the COVID crisis and the lockdown should not be seen in any way as a boon for the environment. COVID is the biggest emergency the world has faced since the founding of the United Nations, um, which was at the end of World War II in 1945. Um, in addition to, to dealing with the health emergency, the Secretary General um, has called for um, what he called a, a wartime response um, in helping countries to build back better from the crisis. And we need to use this opportunity um, of this crisis 
to make a profound systematic shift towards sustain more sustainable economies for both people Our world has the funding, the science, the know-how to do this. What we lack is political will. So let me talk a little bit about UNEP, give you a little introduction for those who may not be aware. Um, so UNEP, the acronym for United Nations Environment Program, um, we are the voice for the environment within the United Nations system. We have 196 member states. Um, and and gov we're governed by the 196 member states and we're the leading authority and decision-making body on the environment in the world. We're not a large organization, um, uh, but our mandate is. We're only in our secretariat, we're only 1,200 staff all around the world. Um, but we're also home to 15 multilateral, uh, what are called multilateral environmental agreements, um, such as things like the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Ozone Secretariat and the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Um, so 2020 was supposed to be a, a super year for nature. Um, on the climate front, we had the Glasgow COP, um, which was supposed to be the most important climate COP since Paris in 2015. Um, we were expecting countries to come to the COP with new uh, nationally determined contributions on how they would be reducing their emissions. We've now seen that COP push back to 2021, but it's absolutely devastating climate disruption from which no one can self-isolate. Um, on Sorry, something's just strange as has happened um, to my screen. Um, sorry, on current unconditional pledges, um, the world is heading for 3.2 degrees centigrade increase by the end of the century. So let me just say that again. If the Paris pledges are even implemented, we'll, by the end of the century will be 3.2 degrees warmer, which is total devastation. Um, UNEP's emission gaps report, which we launch at right ahead of every COP, um, has said that between now and 2030, to meet the 1.5 degrees temperature goal of the Paris Agreement. On the biodiversity front, it was supposed to, 2020 was supposed to be a, 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 another part of the super year. Um, the, the last biodiversity framework, which was set in 2010 in, in Japan, um, is coming to an end. It's largely failed. The world was scheduled to come together in China in November and set the next biodiversity framework for post-2020. And it's absolutely critical. Um, an assessment by, by IPBES last year showed that one million species are threatened with extinction. So despite the postponement of the meetings and the COVID emergency, it's absolutely critical that we maintain and even grow the public awareness and calls for ambitious targets and actions. We cannot postpone climate action and biodiversity action um, because of the emergency. So let me talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the environmental dimensions um, of the disease. Um, over 70% of all emerging infectious diseases um, are, are zoonotic, which means they, they come from animals. Other ones that we've, that we've seen recently are Ebola, bird flu, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, Rift Valley Fever, um, Zika, West Nile Virus. The health of our planet plays an absolutely critical role um, in the spread of zoonotic diseases. And, but our continued erosion of wild spaces, of our primary forests, of our ecosystems have brought us uncomfortably close to reservoir hosts, i.e. the animals and plants that harbor diseases and that can tr transmit them to humans. 
We need to reclaim our forests, stop the deforestation, invest in managing protected areas and our land better. Encroachment by croplands into wildlife habitats is a major factor bringing people into dangerous conflict with wildlife. Wildlife must be seen as a competitive um, land use that allows us to keep wild spaces wild. And then climate change. It's altering weather patterns already, and such as minimum maximum temperatures, precipitation, extreme weather events, and shifting distribution areas of diseases, pathogens, and pests. So let me I'll talk a little bit about what UNEP is doing in responding to, to COVID. Uh, we're trying to improve um, the world's understanding of zoonotic diseases and, and um, as major threats in general. We've got a major new report coming out um, uh, at the start of June um, on looking at, at, at zoonotic diseases and, and what needs to be done to, to uh, stop the next pandemic. We're looking to support the, the design of a zoonotic risk and response program for countries to help countries improve um, their ability to reduce zoonoses. And in addition, look, we're looking to do a global mapping of risks from unregulated wildlife trade, habitat fragmentation, and biodiversity loss. We then have a broader strategy looking at how countries um, can build back better from the crises, as the Secretary General has said. Our recovery from the crises must not take us back to where we were at the start of this year. And our responses, including uh, right now, are including helping countries deal with the mountains of medical waste that have been generated by, by, by COVID, helping um, countries transform um, their relationship with nature. Such sort of highlights include the UN decade of ecosystem restoration that's going to be launched next year. Looking at trans working with, uh, with the FAO and other agencies on transforming agriculture and our food systems and facilitating the provision of seed capital for forest and landscape restoration. We're helping countries build back better um, in line, so they do so in line with nature and not against it. And this means creating green jobs, investing in ecological um, infrastructure, circularity to advance sustainable consumption and production, and response, um, responsible finance for climate stability and ecosystems integrity. So what can people do? At the start of the talk, um, I mentioned that the world has the money, the science and the know-how to shift our societies onto a uh, more environmentally sustainable track. What we lack is the political will. But an individual's greatest agency is their voice. And the next big opportunity for, for people to use that voice and create political momentum is World Environment Day on June 5. And this is the day when the United Nations comes together and we see hundreds of thousands of people around the world coming together to celebrate the environment and call for action. The theme this year is biodiversity. And we're gonna be, we're, tomorrow we'll be launching our global campaign for World Environment Day. And we are hoping to, to inspire everyone to make their voices heard. Citizens need to urge their governments to deliver on their commitments to safeguard nature and pollution and ensure that environmental laws are upheld. Companies need to develop sustainable supply chains as well as agriculture and manufacturing practices that do not harm the environment. Citizens and civil society groups should look at how to preserve and restore degraded ecosystems. And consumers should rethink what they buy. With our lives upended, we can unite to find ways not only to live in harmony with each other, but also with nature. So I urge everybody here on the call and, and, and please share with your networks. Please visit our website, worldenvironmentday.global tomorrow, um, in which you'll, you'll see the global campaign. It's gonna run for the next month um, up until World Environment Day on June 5. Last year, we had an exciting collaboration with ESRAG um, and we jointly developed a, a toolkit uh, for World Environment Day that was sent to all the Rotary Clubs around the world. And I would love to see that toolkit um, recirculated. There were 10 really great ideas in that for what clubs could do. Um, and I would you know, open and welcome a discussion with Rotary um, on, on what we can do to actually really create uh, political momentum that, that, that shifts the world um, to a more sustainable uh, pathway. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Daniel. Very much appreciated giving us this sort of big picture from um, the UNEP perspective, the challenge that it's in front of us, and definitely some um, action points to get around. Um, so just to respond to some of the things in the, in the chat, uh, um, yes, this meeting is being recorded um, and will be made available so you can share it with others. There's some uh, great interest in doing that. Um, Daniel, you talked just a bit about the way that Rotary might play. I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask everyone to put any questions they have for Daniel in the chat. He has to leave us um, uh, before the breakout groups. And so if you have questions for him, that needs to be uh, written in the chat. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask Daniel to um, think specifically about how a community like Rotary that is um, global that represents, um, I can't remember how many millions of people around the world. What could a relationship um, or a role for Rotary look like uh, with UNEP um, around these issues? Well, what we see um, Rotary clubs doing already all around the world is, is doing all sorts of things that, that support the environment. I mean, Rotary, when, you know, is, is huge in terms of, of cleaning waterways, picking up trash, planting trees, uh, supporting sanitation. Um, and so there are so many initiatives that already go on. Um, it's fantastic to see Rotary that has, has put uh, environment as a new priority area. Um, and I'd love to see a, a closer Clo uh, closer collaboration between between Rotary districts uh, and and uh, our regional offices here in East Africa. We've got a very close with sort of some guidance and information from us have gone and and for example they've adopted waterways. Um, there are so many uh, highly polluted rivers in Eastern Africa. And, and so those, there are clubs that are now cleaning up those, uh, those rivers and, um, and also looking at the sources of, those, of, of the pollution. And because Rotary members come from so many different professions, um, whether that's uh, uh, the private sector, civil society, government, Rotary is in a fantastic place to be able to look at the sources of those pollution, exert pressure. On, on the governments to, to enforce the laws that are already in place and, and reduce that pollution and, and, and clean up the environment. So there's so many things already being done. Um, and I, I think that the unit would welcome um, uh, deeper collaboration. Obviously World Environment Day is an excellent sort of uh, way to come together and, and, and bring it together and tell the environmental story. Um, but I can already see it's a, it's a priority. So it's, it's really encouraging. Thanks so much. Sorry, I got kicked out for just a second. Um, thank you so much, Daniel. <laughs> All right. I think for uh, questions of time, we're going to move on, but very, very grateful um, to you for this presentation and hope we can come back to you with ideas um, or connect you with the um, Rotary has an environmental sustainability Rotary action group that we're going to hear from later um, and very much hoping that they can um, maybe make some connections later with UNEP. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Anna, if I could just say, look, I've been, I know ESRAG very well. Um, many of the members of ESRAG, we've been working very well together in the last, last sort of 18 months. Um, and I would welcome collaboration with, with many groups. So, so very happy to, to continue those conversations. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to try to share my, oh, we have, uh, we have one question. Can I just, um, can I just do that? So maybe you can do them together. Um, how is UNEP balancing the post-COVID environment, the economic pressures on companies? Um, how, will, how does UNEP suggest balancing that with our objectives, with their objectives, I think the world's objectives? Um, and then there's an interesting question about experiential education and nature. Um, how can that create momentum in the UN network? Um, 
So those are big questions, um, but maybe maybe taking the first one about the UNEP balancing the pressure, the economic pressures that will be happening after that with their objectives, and then we'll move on to the second speaker. Yeah. Sure. Well, we work with a lot of companies um, all over the world, and a lot of those companies um, are, are not the cleanest. But what we hear from them is they all want to move in the right direction. But for companies to be able to do that, they need the right policy frameworks in place. And that's where the United Nations can play a really critical role in bringing different stakeholder groups together, um, including government, and, and helping governments to understand what policy frameworks, legislative frameworks need to be in place um, so that there's an equal level playing field. So when companies do, um, do the right thing, um, they're not necessarily penalized um, in terms of, you know, uh, compared to their competitors. Um, and so whether that's in the airline industry, the, the soft drink industry, um, or, or, or others, we, we, there's really is a strong desire um, for companies to, to move towards uh, sust um, environmental sustainability. Um, and, and, uh we so we we do everything we can to to help them do um move in that pathway great thank you so much 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 appreciated <laughs> all right so we i'm going to try to share my screen again and we are going to move to our second speaker um uh there we go uh thank you so much daniel we're going to move to Chiara Liguri, did I say that right, Chiara? No, Anna, I would have expected better than from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you say it, but she is, she has a um, really interesting job in pulling as a policy advisor on environment and human rights at Amnesty International. And I'm going to um, have her start right away to talk about this angle on all of this work. Thank you so much for taking your time today. Thanks. Uh, so it's Chiara, Chiara Liguori, uh, and uh, I uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's so nice to be together again with uh, Rotary Peace Fellows in the Rotary family. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, why an organization like Amnesty, so a human rights organization uh, with a worldwide presence, is, uh, is concerned about uh, environment and specifically about climate change. Uh, and, and secondly, we we'll focus about uh, what um, what it means, what the challenges that this COVID-19 uh, crisis means for the environment and for climate change in particular. Although I will touching on some points that Daniel already mentioned, uh, and then also reflect on on, on what um, kind of possibilities there are at the moment um, from a, a human rights and climate change perspective. So uh, first of all, let me uh, say a few words about why climate change is a human rights issue, because uh, uh, it might not be self-evident for everybody, although it has been uh, established clearly um, through, over the last 10 years, at least, especially through um, UN resolutions, human rights bodies, and so on, but also because we have listened to the voices of, of people who were at the front line of, of the climate change impacts. And so uh, indigenous peoples, women, uh, youth, youth, children, and so on. And so we have, we, we, uh, the world has understood that climate change is not just uh, a matter of uh, a, um, you know, uh, animals or the environment, it's really about human lives uh, and human rights. And um, I just want to um, touch on an example that comes uh, very recent. So from this, this week, there was a report which was uh, published from uh, um, another report, but a, a, an article from scientists uh, um, that have actually pointed out that uh, if we continue with the same level of emissions um, uh, by 2070, 30% uh, of the world will be, um, sorry, 30% of the people around the world will be living in uh, areas that are actually um, uh, unlivable because of extreme heat. Uh, and this means uh, living, for example, under the same conditions that they are in the Sahara now, in countries like Pakistan, India, and Nigeria, and so on. And so this means that, uh, that there will be impacts in terms of uh, food security, or in terms of water, access to water. And so here we can see really already the links with human rights, because human rights is not only about civil and political rights, but it's also right to food, right to water, but also right to life. 
uh, so many people uh, will die and are dying already because of uh, uh, climate change uh, impacts that are uh, already striking and uh, we have uh, unfortunately many many examples from around the world uh, think about uh, super typhoon Ayan in the Philippines in 2013 or uh, Arikan Maria in Puerto Rico uh, or in 2017 or last year two cyclones in less than a month uh, striking Mozambique uh, so um, it's uh, it's a green picture but at the same time, um, human rights provide also um, not necessarily a, a solution to everything, but an additional tool. Uh, because uh, um, as clearly these examples show, we can't really continue as business as usual. So states really need to take action to uh, reduce emissions and help people adapt to climate change. And this is not just a moral obligation. Actually, it is uh, also a matter of human rights obligations under human rights law. And as I was saying before, this has been clearly established by, by UN human rights bodies, for example, but also regional human rights bodies. So, the, 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 so states really have the responsibility to reduce emissions to the full extent of their capacities and in the shortest time frame possible, which the, uh, the intergovernmental bodies um, for uh, on climate change has told us that basically we need to reach zero carbon emission by 2050 if we want to stand the chance of uh, um, keeping global heating within 1.5 degrees, uh, otherwise the impacts on, uh, on all our human rights will be even more catastrophic. And so um, if states don't do that, then they are actually um, committing human rights violations. So, so that's uh, amnesty position. Um, and I think this helps in, in terms of accountability, holding uh, states accountable. Um, and so now going back to the COVID um, context, Yes, I, uh, Daniel uh, already pointed out that uh, it's uh, um, the, the disadvantages of COVID on, on climate and environmental protection are all more, much more than the benefits. Uh, so in terms of uh, all the delays that this is uh, contributing to in terms of uh, international conferences and negotiations, uh, but also um, um, we have uh, clearly, uh, there are some risks in the way states respond to COVID that could have harmful impacts on, uh, um, on, on uh, harmful repercussions on, uh, on the climate uh, crisis and, so, oh, and uh, environmental protection in general. So for example, uh, there are countries which uh, are already uh, rolling back environmental protections um, because of the COVID context and the clear example is the US uh, where uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has uh, relaxed uh, its oversight rules on uh, uh, polluting uh, industries during the pandemic or also uh, kind of relax the fuel economy rule, so basically allowing um, more emissions from cars. Um, so this is clearly a, a step back, uh, backwards. Uh, even in, uh, also in Brazil, uh, the environmental agency has uh, less capacity to uh, carry out enforcement activities as, uh, and this is critical, uh, especially in the Amazon because uh, there will be, um, there are risks of uh, flaring up deforestation and the, uh, forced evictions of indigenous people from their ancestral lands. Um, but then um, there are also states who might want to exploit uh, this COVID situation for delaying, uh, unduly delaying climate action, saying that uh, actually they cannot really commit to higher um, targets for emission reductions because of the COVID situation, Already, for example, in March, the Czech Prime Minister said that uh, the European Union should abandon the idea of a Green New Deal. Um, fortunately, this was counterbalanced by a number of other states which are still committed to the, to the option, to the initiative. Um, but still, this is a, a concrete risk. Uh, and then um, also very, very critical is the possibility that because of the COVID economic crisis, um, states go into um, giving a lot of public money uh, to bail out fossil fuel energy companies and aviation companies. And this is basically uh, would be a big mistake uh, if these bailouts are completely unconditional. Uh, obviously, we want to um, protect uh, workers in this industry, so uh, some sort of uh, some subsidies might be necessary, but uh, a completely unconditional bailout is, is detrimental because then you go back into an economy which is entrenched in fossil fuels, 
which is the exact opposite of what we should be doing at the moment. Um, so, uh, and there are already examples, and, and for example, the, the US again, there might be no conditions attached to the bailouts for airline industry. And China also, the permits for um, coal power plants are, have been raising up in the, rising up in the last couple of months, which is quite concerning. Um, so, um, it, 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 but at the same time, uh, yes, there are challenges, but there might also be possibilities, and that's where why we are here for. Um, so, on the on the first, um, uh, first of all, and this is also very aligned to what Daniel was saying, uh, there is the importance of of recognizing that without a healthy environment, we cannot thrive. So, the COVID crisis uh, clearly identified showed us that. Um, uh, a lot of problems can come up uh, if we don't uh, take care of, uh, of, of the environment, uh, loss of biodiversity, um, climate change, um, and, and uh, agric industrial agriculture, and so on. All of these uh, issues that are related and then contribute also to the diffusion of, uh, of uh, um, new diseases, but also make us l less uh, resilient towards, towards this um, uh, these diseases. So, for example, um, on, on air pollution, uh, it's been uh, proved that uh, people who are, who are living are living in areas more exposed to air pollution are also those who are more vulnerable to death from COVID. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, one clear measure to protect uh, ourselves from COVID is the uh, washing hands procedure, but in many contexts, washing hands is just not possible because there's no access to water. And so these are, these are all elements that show us the, the importance of uh, um, in, 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 in ensuring the right to a healthy environment. And again, I obviously coming from a human rights organization, I put everything in terms of, uh, of human rights and the right to a healthy environment is, is there, has been recognized in uh, more than 150 uh, states in a way or another, either in their constitutions or through regional uh, human rights treaties and so on. And there are an important uh, initiatives which also UNEP is supporting about recognizing a global recognition for the right to healthy environments. Um, but also at this stage, uh, in this particular context, we need to think about a, a, a just, just recovery. So um, as I was saying before, um, we, we cannot really go back to, to the not what it was the normal uh, and so uh, because we have learned uh, also another important lessons from COVID is that, uh, is that inequalities matter uh, and so if COVID has eaten so bad, I say it's so bad, uh, different societies is because there, there were a number of inequalities there and so we know that people who are already marginalized or living in poverty are, are the most impacted uh, and and uh, both from the health crisis and from the economic impacts. And this is true also for climate uh, impacts. And so uh, we need to use this moment where states are, are thinking about, um, uh, about um, recovery measures and, uh, and stimulus packages and in order to, move, to ensure that the measures that are taken now don't bring us back to a future that is uh, uh, fossil fuel based and, and based on emissions, but actually moves us towards that um, future which is, uh, needs to be um, achieving the zero, zero carbon emission and the resilient society. Uh, but at the same time, this transition also needs to be just. We, can, uh, we cannot afford to um, make, it, make the move only with those who can afford it. We really need to bring everybody together and, no, and leave, leaving no one behind. And this, is, uh, um, and this means uh, investing in, in green and decent jobs. Um, so pro jobs that are actually uh, provided to all um, and uh, even to those more, most marginalized um, and bring them out of the informal economy. Um, but also uh, means more social protection. And this has been very clear in the COVID crisis as well, uh, that um, we cannot move towards uh, a different uh, type of economy in society if we don't have these, uh, these, these protections in place. But also, I think it's very important to think about international cooperation and, and assistance, because there might be the risk in this stage that states become very, societies become very protective and uh, um, kind of nationalist even more in terms of uh, saying, okay, we can't really help others, we need to help our people first. 
and that would that would be a, a big mistake and uh, because um, the, 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 because of the inequalities also between states and countries that we we know uh, uh, we, we know that we uh, we cannot really close our eyes uh, in front of uh, um, of, uh, of many other you know situations and so for example um, there is a lot of need in terms of uh, finance for uh, climate for developing countries otherwise they will not be able to uh, meet their climate targets otherwise they will not be able to properly adequately protect uh, people from the impact of climate change and so on and so um, there should not be now a reduction in international cooperation but actually uh, we should find new resources mobilized resources for um, increase this uh, uh, this cooperation for climate for recovery recovery for development and so on and so just to finish um, I think going back to what Rotary can do, um, uh, it's, uh, I think at this stage it's very important that we uh, all understand uh, and pressure, put pressure where we can uh, for uh, public money not to be invested in, uh, in polluting industries, but actually being used to, to, work, to, to make this uh, shift towards a just uh, and, and green um, uh, society and future. And so uh, I, from a campaigning organization perspective, I would say that it's really important to keep an eye on what's happening in national level and really uh, try to influence those processes when we can or, uh, or react when, uh, when there are um, situations that are quite concerning. And I'll uh, stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chiara. Thank you very much. Um, that is great. And we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I am a, a we, we are going to keep this to the hour and a half, 90 minutes, so I can't go through all of the questions. Um, but uh, I'll start with this one uh, from Luis. Um, can you say that there is a fiduciary duty of directors of companies to address environmental issues and human rights issues? Uh, maybe we'll start with that one. Do you mind if I if I send you a couple? I'm sure you can see them as well. Um, but also, uh, there are a couple questions about the work of Amnesty and their outreach and commitment to Indigenous peoples. Um, indigenous peoples' ways of life is centered on sustainable living and nurturing the land. Uh, they are being forced to change their lifestyles toward more consumer-centric. Is looking after the ancestral land and environment not a human right? Um, and then maybe um, we'll just look at this last one. Uh, how would you see climate solution addressing the power of nuclear conflagration? Um, can we take those three? And then I think there's a great question from Anna Prada as well, but that is something that maybe we can focus on in the uh, breakout discussions, is how are socio-environmental conflicts hindering peace building? I think that's something that maybe we can discuss in the groups, but if you wanna address that. Chiara, are you, is that okay if you try to address a few of those? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's taking some time to read them because they're quite long. Uh, but um, so on the first one about uh, companies, um, uh, yes, I mean, companies have a uh, human rights, um, a, a, a responsibility of human rights, exercising human rights due diligence. And this means uh, making sure that, uh, that their actions of their companies or, or uh, um, omissions do not uh, result in human rights um, abuses uh, and so and, and this is not only true for one company but also throughout the supply chain and so uh, and this applies also for uh, environmental arms uh, and, uh, um, and, 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 and in climate and climate as well it harms related to climate. So I, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm answering to that question. Uh, on indigenous people, um, there are a number of indigenous peoples are affected in, in uh, multiple ways. Uh, so they, they are the most uh, affected in many cases by climate change because of uh, their contact with, the, with the, the, the nature, which is impacted uh, the most, but also um, because mo many times also by, by projects from renewable energy projects that are conducted without their uh, prior uh, informed, uh, free prior and informed consent. So they face enormous challenges. 
Um, sometimes, like in Canada, for example, they also part of uh, the fossil fuel. I mean, they they work in in the fossil fuel industry. So, uh, in, in certain contexts, it's also uh, important when we move uh, move away from uh, from uh, phase out fossil fuels that we take into account how do we uh, again address the, the needs of this workforce and so on. Uh, and for example, indigenous peoples that that are heavily um, in, uh, employed by the industries. Um, and in terms of, uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't know if this is answering the question, but uh, um, um, yes, looking after ancestral, uh, sorry, ancestral land is a human rights. Actually, indigenous people have a uh, right to the, uh, lands, uh, to their ancestral lands. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's a serious human rights violation, as I said, when uh, um, th their land is taken away uh, for either fossil fuel or renewable projects without uh, pre free prior and informed consent. Uh, and the last one, um, uh, no clear configuration. Um, Maybe just maybe if you can um, just make a tie between socioeconomic and peace building, um, the challenges that the I think that was the question, but some of these will will have to leave for the discussion. Um, there was a question about uh, socioeconomic socio environmental conflicts hindering peace building. Um. Yeah, there are uh, a number of uh, um, links between uh, environmental, um, um, sorry, issues and, and, and conflict. And so, um, for example, um, the, the, the link is, is twofold. Sometimes uh, you have um, conflicts that are um, increased uh, because of uh, pressures on the natural environments. Uh, but on the other hand, um, and then you have uh, sometimes you have migration out of these of these conflicts. On the other hand, uh, um, uh, there is also um, uh, impacts of, of conflicts uh, on um, sorry the impact that uh, conflicts have uh, on uh, on the protection of the environment. So so there are a number of uh, of issues that there are linked. But uh, this is uh, a bit outside my expertise. <laughs> Okay, well, um, we have put you through the ringer with those questions, but, um, and there are a lot more on there, but we're gonna have to leave those to be discussed maybe in the breakout groups. I want to get to our final speaker, but first, thank you so much, Chiara, for your time and this very important perspective from Amnesty on the human rights issues related to climate change and environment under COVID. Thank you so much. I see some applause for you in the various chats. Um, thank you. Now we are going to move, um, to Elisa Hernandez de Pablo. Um, she's the head of environment at La Casa Incendida Fundacion Montre Madrid. And she will let us know what her foundation does. Everybody, Thank you very much. Please stay muted and put your questions in the chat. This is our last speaker before we go into the discussion groups. Thank you so much, Elisa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this initiative and having me here also. Um, I'm going to try to be very short because thanks to Daniel and Chiara, we have already had a huge amount of information and very well explained on the complex facts of the issues we're discussing, highlighting the key aspects of what we need to keep in mind. So I am going to explain a bit of what I do in a cultural organization um, and how I try to give back to society on, on this issue. And it's going to be a more individual um, point of view also, since we're going to be working in the, in the groups next, I think it'll be useful so that we can start putting our imagination in line on what we need to do next. So as Anna presented me, I'm head of environment in a cultural and educational center where we transversely work on arts and sustainable issues. Um, my main role is to manage the environmental program. We offer courses, events, festivals, experiential learning. And this means I have to tap into society's current trends uh, on, on the different issues, but I also have to be able to offer attractive ways to understand cutting edge um, alternatives. So this means that sometimes I will have to be thinking of how to shake things up a bit or maybe get into smaller niche areas or also make serious topics available and accessible. 
um, when COVID-19 has confronted us with the reality of how fragile we are and when we went into a global lockdown, we have tried to keep on opening a space for uh, participation and analysis through a virtual program. And we've been working since the beginning uh, on the different discourses that have appeared. So when in March we started hearing a more crisis narrative, we tried to offer webinars that were going to talk on how ecological options could give um, opportunities to emergencies. So we would discuss what emergencies are, their characteristics, and for example, how eco neighborhoods were already um, working on ideas for sustainable solutions, or how uh, communities are rising to the front line to, to be problem solvers for underprivileged, older, or vulnerable people right now. As we entered into April and the discourses started having more dystopian uh, comparisons between uh, our reality and different types of um, movies or series, we decided to set up a set of activities based on ecotopian literature and science fiction. And we've just finished the webinars where we were reviewing and discussing future scenarios so we could um, offer narratives that could be um, a spur to imagination towards where we should be heading. And we will be working on a collaborative design of future scenarios in a workshop. And we will also be offering a series of movies and, and different books so that maybe during summer people can think of different options of worlds they would like to live in. But of course, as we keep on advancing on the, on the situation, we realize we need to refocus on issues that were currently on the table like climate change and biodiversity loss and have been as already has been explained put to the side or uh, put further on into the future and um, we need to regain control over these processes even if we do not have a physical interaction we need to keep on talking about them and have them um, on the table as we discuss on them. So for May, we are going to be holding online discussions on how to communicate climate change with practitioners, with journalists, with cultural organizations and NGOs. Um, we'll also be offering a workshop on um, development cooperation and climate change in a one world, one health um, uh, perspective. And we are going to be having at the end of May a five day cinema and debate festival on biodiversity, renaturalization, and regeneration. So I can't go into too much detail to uh, the other issues that we are doing in, the, in our cultural center in solidarity or arts, but I did want to highlight these, these aspects of what we've been doing for the last two months and a half because they have been, so as to say, our initiatives to offer alternatives uh, to what is going on and they have they have three main intentions which which i think are important to highlight first of all we want to give alternatives to the main discourses and shift the focus towards solutions and actions second we want to provide space for participation and exchange of opinions and third we want to avoid paralysis due to limited narratives and these are these are seeds but they can help us with the immense task of understanding the situation and more than anything creating our own discourse because we are confronted constantly with this daunting task of digesting enormous amounts of information which come from our family tv social media family uh, friends whatever and we we have to be very quick to receive this information put it into our own cognitive understanding so we can participate in the general discussion which is which is happening and as these are the two pivotal points which I think that um, we need to think about as individuals very much at this point where we're on a, a, such a virtual uh, world, which is how do we decide to digest the information and process it and what are we going to do with it? And this means everything from what is the source I choose to give legitimacy to and up to how do I reproduce this information with others? And this is crucial because as we've been explaining with Chiara and, and Daniel, we're seeing um, a, a, a rise in hate speech and xenophobia and human rights violations. Um, and we're also seeing more than ever the interdependency of our ecological, social, economical, and political um, ecosystem. 
And these interlinkages between our actions and the global unprecedented implications are huge. And the data and the number are overwhelming. And when things get too huge and they get too big for us little people to actually understand, we tend to paralyze and we tend to ignore it or hope that someone will come and solve it. And this is when we have to go back and think of those two pivotal points I was saying, which is what we receive as information, how we process it, and what we decide to do with it. And this is crucial because what we see, what we, what we decide to see, our frame, is where we act upon. And so currently my effort is trying to offer alternatives on how to reframe the information and move towards solutions. And this is also linked to, of course, what Daniel and, and, and Chiara were saying, as in, this is our voice, which we will have to leverage to make political action happen and keep the political momentum happening. And also, um, Chiara already gave magnificent ways of how to reframe the political measures and how to portray just uh, recovery and to keep a human rights perspective in. So I'm going to very, very briefly, so that we can start working on the group sessions, just take one of the three questions we had in the um, in the discussion, uh, and it is, what are the intended and unintended benefits and opportunities of the pandemic? And I think that this is a question that we're all constantly asking ourselves, because although there are certain aspects that we want to, to stay with them in the next future that we decide on how it's going to be, we cannot link it to the pandemic itself. We have to be very clear on it in the reframing of the sense that it is political will, it is a social will to be able to have a just and green transition. And I think that it's important that when we think of benefits or opportunities, we link it to those aspects which we want to keep and define well which are the aspects we want to keep and define well which are the ones we want to take out of the picture. So as you can see, reframing has a lot to do, and this is the tool that I think we, we could use, in expanding our horizons and trying to include new angles to these polyedric um, challenges we have. It has to do with breaking down the information to bit sizes we can work upon. And I think that what's most important, and, and I just want to finish up here so we can start also working, is we need to be very clear on how we choose the information, reliable sources, how we keep a human rights perspective always in front of, of the information we're receiving from general media to families and friends, and break down the information so that we can reframe what part we want to work on. So I would say create your own discourse towards the world you want, but always keeping these types of frameworks in mind. Thank you. I'm very fast. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa. Much, much appreciated. Um, and you've given us a lot uh, to think about and also a nice bridge into the breakout groups. And I think if you don't mind, um, and because you're able to stay with us um, and uh, to actually facilitate a, a breakout group, we might go um, straight into that. So. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers, a lot to think about and um, um, and a lot for the Rotary community. A lot of possibilities have been put in the chat of things to think about and talk about. We're going to now break the whole group um, into rooms. Um, Bill is going to make that magic happen. And each group will have a facilitator and the facilitator will ask each group um, to identify or to someone to volunteer to be a reporter and a recorder. Um, the reporter will write down um, some uh, one or two uh, big points that the group decides they want to share with the bigger group. Um, and that's the recorder. And the reporter will actually um, report back to the bigger group. We're going to have 20 minutes now in the breakout groups. And you can see the questions here. Um, and I will copy those questions into the chat as well um, so that you have them in your group. So basically we're looking at what are your what is your major learning insight or discovery so far? Uh, what do we still need to learn about in terms of the overall impact? What are the dilemmas or opportunities that you can identify as we explore ways to address the challenges that have been identified? 
What would it take for us, Rotary, to create change on this issue? And how can we support each other in taking the next steps? Now, each group doesn't have to respond to all of those. Um, if you are having a really great discussion on one of those, you can stay there. Um, but these are the questions really meant to just stimulate your imagination and brainstorming sessions. So um, thanks to our facilitators. And I think Bill is going to move us into uh, these rooms. Yep, everybody is placed in a breakout room and those will start now. Um, and uh, hear from our last two um, action uh, speakers about action. So please keep it to one or two points, basically about one minute, because we have 10 groups to go through. And can we start with group one? Group one would be uh, either Sybil or Jeff, whoever wants to uh, jump in. I can, I can jump in. This is Sybil from Jubit's Family Foundation. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. It was great to meet everybody in my breakout. And we had a great conversation. The top two things, um, the top two things, which we had probably 15 things of importance, is um, the importance of acting local to go global. And in order to sort of bridge that gap between the idealistic vision and the reality of implementation of that vision. And then the second key point um, that I heard is linked to um, Rotarians can be activists and advocates. And there was a lot of hope also for the future generations and that opportunity. So we sort of ended up leaning into opportunity and hope and trying to bridge the gap between the challenge and opportunity to get there to the end. But we had talked a lot more about substance as well, but I'm trying to model good behavior as the first person. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank, Thank you, Sybil. Thank you. Thank you. Please remember each group. Um, points in the chat because that's the way we'll be able to share out as well. Okay, group two. Oh, hi. Good morning, everyone from New Zealand, where it's 4 a.m. or just after 4, 4 and a half. Um, so Elaine Mead, I'm the governor-elect for my district. And things that we came up with, uh, one was um, let's not buy into the um, idea that you can't afford to be able to meet the um, environmental challenges that we know that everyone, there is an economic sort of debate coming on, but it, that's um, it's it's too easy to buy into the fact that we can't afford to respond to the environment. And also that then we talked about what do we need to learn and the view was that in fact we feel that we don't need to actually learn anything more. We know what's going on. We actually now need and that idea about being overwhelmed by information. We just now need to actually talk about what we know and take action. And in terms of um, Rotary and what Rotary and Rotarians can do. There was uh, a sense and discussion around certainly um, utilizing uh, the youth, um, Rotaract and Interact, in terms of where their focus is, because this is a strong area for them to act as advocates and to take the view that we are actually more than just a service organization. Let's, we, um, the environment is important to all of us. We all have an impact on it. So let's actually step forward on that and lead as Rotarians and a Rotary organization and setting an example in terms of what we actually do. Um, I have to share a personal view here. I think we take, we create way too much landfill as an organization. Um, and, you know, we need to look at that. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate that. And I see that the breakout groups are beginning to write into the chat their points. Please, every group should be writing their points in the chat. Okay, group three, please join in. And thanks for the New Zealand 4 a.m. Wow, that's a big deal. <laughs> okay, group three, please. Oh, hey. Um, okay, I'll just uh, read out the key point. So, 
point one we uh, talked about is education and knowledge exchange. So knowledge exchange is uh, 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 converging Western and indigenous knowledge and, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, finding solution for the best practice and uh, how to design our uh, the future, sustainable future. And another uh, key points, we talked about population growth. So because that was missing in the main discussion uh, and also talked about the community, uh, the power of community, which is uh, gardening, you know, and uh, helping each other. And I think uh, that's also being now increasingly coming out in the news from all over the world, people, you know, uh, getting back to the land and nature, getting their hands dirty. So that in turn help, uh, help the environment and also uh, increase the food security. And another key point we talked about the youth and uh, this time of the crisis, how they came with, you know, sense of responsibility and understanding and about uh, the climate change and environment issues. So all these key, uh, key three points together and we arch Rotary uh, to, you know, address and then uh, focus on these things. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh, you're muted right now, Anna. I'll refer to our fourth group, which is Elsa's group. Okay, but just to be clear, Mong, you were with group seven, right? Just because I don't want to miss anyone, but we'll go to Elsa's group. <laughs> Hi, so this is Summer. I'll be reporting for group four. Um, just to distill down some of the conversations that we had, what we found really useful about uh, the webinar and the presenters was looking at things from different levels. So looking at high level perspectives on climate change, but then also thinking about moving down to local. What is it that we can do at a local level? And in terms of the specific question about Rotarians and Rotary, what can, what can we do as members in one way or another of Rotary? We talked quite a bit about um, the different areas of focus, how there's also a, on the books, a potential new area of focus for the environment, which we also think is very important, something like that coming from a high level. Um, also mentioned that at least within the other areas of focus, there are policy statements on the environment, and those are guidelines that can, can help Rotarians, especially as they're looking at projects and, and efforts within different areas of focus, how to imbue the environment in that and to consider the environment. Um, so we saw a lot of potential uh, from Rotary International level down to club level, and also just talked about the importance of individuals, how we relate to Rotary clubs, and bringing that information to them. Thanks. Thank you very much. Group three, which is you, Elsa. Uh, who is that? That is uh, Elisa, group three. Hi, hey, I'm reporting in for our group. Um, so we had talked about the intersectionalities of so many challenges um, between the environment and mental health and nuclear warfare, the economy, um, so many others, particularly in the midst of the um, COVID-19 crisis. Um, and we talked about uh, that denial of climate change was among the biggest challenges being faced and the need to sort of unite and advocate around that. Um, one of our group members talked about integrating climate concerns into teaching practices. And um, we talked also, uh, referencing back to um, Summer's points about these different levels, but talking about uh, needing to engage holistically sort of throughout tiers of society um, and uh, be, Rotary being a, a way that we can mobilize that because of its global reach, um, because it reaches across many tiers of society and connects even the diversity of people within platforms such as this. As this. Uh, we talked about peace programs and peace building programs through um, Rotary as being really um, wonderful and critical to these processes. And also mentioned um, Rotary considering adding climate as an additional focus area and our um, sort of a desire to advocate for that as well. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, Dennis Wong from group five, please. Thank you. Uh, actually, we addressed two questions, I think, uh, what we learned. And one of the things that came up was uh, the fact that uh, inequality really came up. And uh, the whole problem of uh, that sometimes, in, depending on where you live, uh, basically local issues and local problems took precedence over global issues and global problems. Uh, and it was pointed out even in Haiti and things when uh, you don't have uh, water to wash your hands, the idea of uh, drink, washing your hands and doing certain things uh, are sort of like in, incompatible. So I think there's uh, certain things that then looking at the, the global solutions and, and things, there's also the idea of uh, you still have to look at the local problems and what the priorities might be for certain people. Uh, so that was one of the, the things. The second thing is, uh, from the first, from the speakers, there was the whole idea of uh, political will, political commitment, and which addressed the idea of uh, what road we could do to change. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things is, is uh, how do we, as Rotary and Rotarians, address matters of policy and politics that might be necessary to make the necessary changes. And uh, I think we looked at uh, uh, peace fellows and peace centers to possibly help us uh, in address this particular issue. Uh, and because we hear so much, you know, at times about the, a controversy about the, that Rotary or Rotarian shouldn't be political, at the same time, we know that certain issues are political and based on policy. So where's that line that we go up to or cross over, whatever? And uh, so uh, many of us appreciate what the, the Peace Centers and Peace Fellows are doing. So we look for you all to, for guidance in those <laughs> two things. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've got a couple more groups to get through and I'm going to ask everybody's patience to, to go a little bit over um, because we want to hear from our two action points at the very end. We're going to have to be very brief. But what groups have we not heard from yet? Can someone raise their hand, please? Group six. Brian, you go ahead, Brian. 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 Great. That's okay. Hi, uh, very quickly, <laughs> we addressed a couple of the things, most of the things that has been mentioned. We realize that Rotarians have their own passions for the environment and each one is the most important. But we said that first we feel that uh, there has to be an acceptance that there is an environmental issue and that this is done through education. And this is where Ro Rotary and Rotarians and the Rotary Action Groups can uh, come in to, to help. And we talked about th there seems to be a chasm, a chasm between all the possibilities and what we can actually accomplish. And how do we differentiate that? How do we actually make something happen out of all these possibilities? Thank you very much. Dakota, can you report in from group nine? Uh, Dakota's at, had to drop off. I think I can, I can do it. Can you hear me? Yes, thank yeah. you. Sorry. Um, so it's Derek here from group nine. Um, our, we have three or four points. Uh, learning point is that it's understanding our, our personal and the people that we're talking to, their context for communication is important, uh, especially at the, at the grassroots level in order to reframe what we know. That was an important thing that we learned. Um, po we also talked about how post-COVID uh, available rotary funding and other NGO funding may be impacted due to bailing out of companies and have to take that into consideration how to pivot. Uh, the third of four points is habit change and data. Can we as Rotary take advantage of the momentum, the COVID momentum uh, with, regarding uh, the response to data and changing of behaviors uh, that people have seen their, their experienced uh, evidence that their own personal behaviors can actually make a difference in terms of what's happened in the uh, in uh, pollution and and, uh, and so forth, uh, to take advantage of that momentum and, and shift it over to the environmental side. Um, and second and last one is uh, the opportunity to engage youth with Rotary to take advantage of combining the passion of youth and the power of the Rotary network. I think we've heard about that before as well. 
That's fantastic, the power of youth. A favor for group six, please. Okay, um, in, in group six, um, we... Uh, on conclusion and healed about, uh, we found out that some limitations that we have is that some areas there is no water, they have limited water. There are walls and um, there are also pollutions of the, of the seashore line. Then we said that what we can do is to actually invest in the young people and because they are our future. Also, we looked at, um, we said that we know there is, that there is scarcity and limited resources to, able to, to be able to solve all these problems. So we can actually do the least that we can to be able to impact um, in our local environment. We also said that people can actually, um, we want to change the discussion from moving from um, what we are giving up to what we are going to gain in giving in our resources. So with all these things, we hope that um, by the time we're able to implement these things, uh, uh, we'll be able to do quite a lot um, in our own local environment. Also, we also encourage that um, local club could actually build up, uh, have a committee on peace building because for, for, for some areas, they don't know what to do. So if you have this committee in our, in our local setting, uh, we think that things can actually change for the better for us. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have all the groups now? No, I'm uh, group 10. Okay, you're gonna wrap it up quick, Kim Ford. Okay, so I'll just say we covered many of the same topics and Geraldine from Cape Town, South Africa was passionate about rotary and environmental sustainability. So Geraldine, would you share please? Geraldine? Geraldine, you're muted. Geraldine, you're muted. Very briefly, um, we spoke about a number of things, but the important one we focused on, particularly given the time frame, was the issue of if, as Elaine said, we must take action and we must lead, then we believe strongly that Rotary Board and Rotary Trustees must make the decision to take us to the seventh area of focus, because we cannot get funding out of Rotary for global grants if it isn't a seventh area of focus. It was agreed at the assembly in January that the, Ian Risley would take it on and propose a solution and the task team is working on it for the April meeting. But it fell off the agenda again at the April meeting. And so we want to encourage everybody that we, if Rotary is going to lead in environmental sustainability, that they do need to get their districts to support the environmental sustainability has been the seventh area of focus. Because if we don't have it, we can't access funding for that. And I think that summed up the most important part that we had. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. And that takes us, uh, Lewin, are you, uh, are you reporting in? What you're muted. What I just did is a way of the mute people Clapping hands, so I'm oh, saying well done, okay. Geraldine. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> clapping hands. Yes. yes, I think Geraldine, you, you bring us really quickly into the two action points. I'm sorry we've gone over, um, but this has been such a great discussion and I actually get a lot of hope and um, sense of optimism out of how everyone has been engaged. So thank you so much. We had two um, sort of immediate action points, but I think Geraldine has given us another one, frankly, and I might be going back to her for more information. Um, but I did want to have Patricia Schaefer talk to us briefly about a new initiative for environmental education in the Rotary family. Patricia, this is gonna have to be real quick. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so very quickly. Um, so what's amazing to me about, uh, with all that's been covered, I keep hearing a few themes. I keep hearing implementation, uh, youth, uh, the role of education and what can Rotary do. So just quickly, the team, including Anna, asked me to make you aware that uh, an initiative was launched on Earth Day, April 22nd. And it was an initiative that was a collaboration between the organization I had, New Gen Peace Builders, and an organization called Footprint App. And you might have seen a chat message from Dakota Stormer. He is the head of Footprint App. And he, uh, while I am a Rotary Peace Fellow and Peace Educator, um, he is involved in sustainability at Shell. He's a UN Sustainability Development Goals Facilitator and so on. 
So we launched an initiative that in essence addresses the fact that in the United States in 2015, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Association, set a goal of a 50% reduction in carbon emissions, food waste and waste to landfills by the year 2030. There is not an education program that is actively distributed and employed with high school students in the United States around the intersection between environmental sustainability and peace building. And in the number of environmental sustainability classes is growing in the United States while the interest in peace education is growing. So we combined forces and have developed a whole set of lesson plans, teacher training, uh, interactive exercises and action project training to be available to high school students. It will be launched in the fall, uh, but we announced it on April 22nd, Earth Day, and have gotten a ton of interest. Here's what we're suggesting. It's an intersection of education, peace, environment, and rotary. And we're encouraging uh, Rotarians to find out about the program, find out about how they can support its introduction in local high schools by making the materials available. And importantly, part of the content is drawn from or related to the Institute for Economic and Peace and their eco ecological threat register, as well as content on the eight pillars of peace from the Rotary Positive Peace Academy. So we ask you to get to know more about it. Uh, we also encourage all Rotarians always to, to go and learn about the Positive Peace Program and eight pillars through the Peace Academy. Uh, and because of Footprint app and a, a variety of tools will be um, delivering to the schools, we remind everybody there are ways to measure your own carbon footprint. And if we have 1.2 million Rotarians connected to a lot of organizations, that's a very practical thing that Rotarians can do. So I think um, Anna and the team are gonna put up a flyer about that program, that intersection of environment and peace building. Look at the flyer and if you'd like more information, we'd be happy to tell you more. I think Anna dropped off. So I think last to, to finish up the meeting, uh, we were going to have Karen um, from the Environmental Sustainability Rotarian Action Group just give some information briefly on how people can get involved. And I'll just remind everyone that all of these follow-up action items and initiatives are going to be shared after the meeting. Karen, can you share about that? I'd love to. Thanks, everyone. It's now courtesy of the Board of Directors of RI, a Rotary Action Group. Uh, anyone on the planet is now empowered to join a Rotary Action Group. And I would like all of you on this call to become members of the Environmental Sustainability Group. Uh, there's a real tension in RI between uh, clubs can't be political or endorse things, but Rotarians are charged to be active, informed citizens of the world. Follow the ladder and find your political voice as individual Rotarians. Lots of questions about the status of the area of focus. I presented to the Environmental Issues Task Force. I am told they have completed their recommendation. The trustees declined to pick it up in April because they were frantic about COVID and all of a sudden not meeting face to face. At this point, I think the most effective effective thing, all of you peace fellows and other listeners, if you have a personal relationship with one of the current trustees or RI board members, send them a personal note about how your work in Rotary would be enhanced by having not necessarily a seventh area of focus, but an area of focus on the environment that is not paired with or combined with one of the other existing areas. Seven isn't a magic number, six isn't a magic number, but the environment has to be freestanding. In your pitch to them, if you are a peace fellow, you are a beneficiary of their generosity and good rotary stewardship means empowering you and rotary to work on the environment. Um, there are lots of, we have a lunch out of landfills program that is, deals with food waste. So there's a curriculum, I hope Dakota will check it out. Um, we have a youth movement within Rotary called the Climate Solution, within SRAG called the Climate 
Solutions Coalition, and it was founded by um, uh, exchange student from France, and they have hundreds of members. I'm going to put the link to them. They're currently using the uh, COVID confinement to rebuild their webpage, but the email from their founder will be in the chat stream in a moment. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. SRAG would be so enhanced to have all of you participating in our efforts to do in renewable energy, create carbon calculators for clubs, help Rotarians offset their carbon travel. Um, please join us. And thank you so much for all you have done to be trail breakers for Rotary to find its way with the environment. Great, thank you so much. Does everyone hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much to Karen um, and for giving us a very specific action we can take right away as Rotarians and as Rotary Club. So we're gonna close this. Thanks again for all your patience and time, but I want to just, um, um, the last note is that all of these webinars are moving us towards a cyber conference that will be developed, created, organized by Rotary Peace Fellows, June 26th, 27th, and 28th. And it's called Envisioning the World After the Great Pause. So we hope that all these discussions and the topics that people wanted to speak about and delve more into, that we will find some space to do that for this cyber conference. Thank you all so much. Um, this will be available as a recording um, and we'll also take uh, notes from the chat and all the groups. Thank you so much for your, for your time, your participation to the facilitators, to Bill and to the Rotary community and have a great evening, morning, day,